Well, we're here again with Wall Street Silver for another AMA, Ask Me Anything. And today we have a special guest, John Miniotis. He's the CEO of Abra Silver, which used to be Abra Pata. So thank you for joining us today, John. We appreciate you making the time. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It's, uh, it's my pleasure. Well, the first thing I got to ask is last week, you just changed the name of your company. It used to be Abra Pata. And as any good silver mining company should, you've changed it and now inserted the word silver into your name. Although someone on Twitter told me your former name was also Pata, means silver exactly. in Spanish. So you already had silver. You're just changing it now for American and Canadian investors, so to speak. Correct. Yeah, yeah. No, so so the, I think, you know, the, the name overall, I think Abra Silver just better reflects who we are as a company. Mm -hmm. So the, the company's focus, of course, hasn't changed. It's always been on silver. Uh, we have one of the largest advanced stage primary silver projects out there. Um, and like you just mentioned, I mean, Spanish, of course, uh, in, in Spanish, Plata means silver. And mm -hmm. so we literally just translated that portion of our name. And, you know, I think the, the new name just reflects, look, we're a Canadian-based silver company. Um, you know, we want to make that clear to our North American investors. And we, you know, we, we feel we're, we're rapidly merging as, as one of the premier silver exploration plays out there. Um, and just want to make sure that, that nothing's getting lost in translation. Yeah, it, it makes total sense, uh, just from a defining, defining the company type of point of view. Um, so let's dive right into the questions. We we got a lot of questions on Twitter and from our Redditors. Um, yeah. You have multiple projects uh, at last count, four or there, is there's a fifth one now. Right. But your main focus is the Blios. I'm hoping I pronounced that right in Argentina. <laughs> is that correct? Close enough. I know, I know which one you mean. <laughs> yeah, uh, you better know which one I mean. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. So, so our flagship project uh, is called Diablilos. It's it's for sure our main asset. It's in one of the top mining jurisdictions in in all of Latin America. It's in the Salta province in Argentina. Uh, it's it's quite a large scale project. So it already has over 140 million ounces wow. on a silver equivalent basis, and that's growing very very rapidly here. And so there was a, a preliminary economic study done on the project uh, back in 2018 which shows this, this project is already very highly economic, uh, but really our focus has been on drilling, expanding it, looking to, to grow the resource base uh, further. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'd say our, our exploration team has just managed to do a remarkably consistent job uh, on that front and witnessed by, again, uh, some stellar results that, that we came out with this morning, which I'm, I'm happy to talk about as well. Yeah, that's, let's dive right into that because that's one of the reasons we wanted to get you on. Um, what yeah let's go through the drilling results that you announced give us a give us a quick little two minute summary if you could yeah yeah so so we announced uh three and a half holes <laughs> unfortunately because of the delays with covid uh there's you know uh, i think globally there, there's just mm -hmm. been delays in receiving back uh drill results and so we've only received a partial hole uh a portion of, of one of the holes uh, but that was already so far it seems like a, a world-class silver intercept that, that we intersected here so over 17 meters of 1,500 grams per ton in that partial hole. Um, now, importantly, I can't stress this enough. I mean, this is in oxides. This is close to surface uh, within uh, a defined this, sort of open pit. These um, are shallow, shallow, low cost type of exactly. uh, resources that you're finding is what you're saying. Exactly, That's exactly. Good. This is not, you know, deep, uh, narrow vein, uh, you know, uh, veins mm -hmm. that we're chasing here. This is within a uh, conceptual open pit. Um, and that 17 meters of 1,500 grams uh, was in a much broader 80 meter intercept uh, with wow. excellent grades. So over 500 grams uh, per ton on a silver equivalent basis for that wow. 80 meters. And the kicker is um, this is only <laughs> less than half of, of the hole that we've received so far. So we're still waiting for the first 160 meters of this mm -hmm. hole. So the, the, the shallowest portion. Um, and, you know, we, we've found native silver in, in part of that portion that, that hasn't been announced yet. And so this, you know, really has the potential. I mean, we obviously have to wait and see. We don't know what the results are from, from that 160 meters. Um, but, you know, certainly this has the potential to be a, a truly a, a world-class intercept here. And I'm, I'm not using that uh, language lightly. I think this is, um, you know. Yeah, I, I, I recall a chart that a, a good friend of mine online posted last year of 
the top 20 intercepts uh, of, of last year, 2020. And this sounds like it's, you know, probably at the lower, it's, it's in that top 25 to 30 if this had been in the year 2020, isn't it? In terms of the intercept results? Yeah, well, we don't know yet. That's the thing. So we have 80 meters already. I mean, yeah. how much further does it extend? I mean, there's still yeah. 160 meters to be defined. So um, certainly I, I think it classifies, but importantly, I'd, I'd say the vast majority of the other intercepts. So when you get over a kilo uh, intercepts in the gold space, it's generally within sulfides, generally sort of deeper. Um, you don't generally get widths uh, like this. I mean, we've come out earlier Within the same exploration program, we announced uh, an earlier intercept. I think it was like 18 meters of 600 grams gold or silver, um, and so you know that's generally seen as, as a very good intercept. But to get 80 meters of, you know, 500 grams, wow. 80 meters currently. I mean, I, I think it's uh, much much better than than certainly we expected. Uh, well, and so we're we're keen to get the the remainder of the hole uh, to say the well, least. In previous interviews, you've sort of defined your your resources um, at around 140 million ounces of silver equivalent. That's a combination of gold and silver, but you're you're measuring it in silver equivalents. Right. Um, does the do these new results? Is this about confirming that, or are these new results so good that you're ex it has the potential to expand beyond mm -hmm. that previous 140 million estimate that you've made? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, so certainly. So the entire drill program, so we're just finalizing a 13,000 meter drill program here. And really the, the purpose of that program was to expand the existing resource. So we already have within the indicated category, 80 million ounces of silver, 730,000 ounces of gold. Um, and really the, the focus of the program has really been more so on the gold side. We think there's a very significant potential to increase mm. the gold tonnage and, and grades. Um, and of course, drill results like this, I mean, surely yeah. <laughs> you can add a lot of silver ounces as well. And so we're, we're looking to expand the existing resource, but still focus on just the oxides. Uh, so some of the, the drilling that we've announced uh, over the past few months um, has gone deeper into the sulfides. And we've gotten some excellent sulfide hits as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, that represents more blue sky potential. We'll likely follow those holes up in the next round of drilling. Uh, but, but for now, the purpose is to increase the, the oxide portion of the resource um, and then come out with an updated PA study within the next uh, six months here. So what would uh, the next, when are you expecting more of the, these, you said some of the drill results are still outstanding. When are you expecting that additional data that you'll be able to announce? Correct. So yeah, no, these holes have been drilled <laughs> back in December. So unfortunately, we've been uh, expecting it for, for quite a while now. There, there's been delays globally, as you know, talking. These are independent third party confirmations of your results, right? That you're waiting on, uh, not your own interpretation of, course, no. of the data. Yeah, yeah. No, we send it to a lab, an independent lab down. Okay. In, it's in Lima, Peru. So there's uh, logistic issues, transportation issues. Uh, but anyways, I mean, the, the results are, are coming in uh, slowly but surely. Um, and so, yeah, I'd say, you know, we should have results every few weeks here. Um, and that's why we've been coming out with press releases as we get two, three, four holes in, uh, we, we announce it. But certainly as soon as we get the, the rest of this hole, uh, uh, assuming it's, it's well mineralized, uh, we'll, we'll certainly announce that. So it could be, okay. uh, it's a matter of a, a week or two, I'd say, uh, before okay. we get the, the remaining results from, from this hole 27. Awesome. Now, John, Evan, you it, go ahead. yeah, so it's a, it's an absolute pleasure having you on here, John, like from the Wall Street Silver community on Reddit, we, we really appreciate you. One of the questions from our members is one for uh, at what price of gold or silver does your project need to be viable? Yeah, so that's that's one of the benefits. So the PA study uh, was completed back in 2018. It used what's currently considered very, very conservative commodity prices. So at $20 silver and $1,300 gold uh, were the long-term commodity price assumptions assumed then. Um, based on that price deck and using the, the existing resource and so not including any of the, the drilling, of course, that, that we've done subsequent, um, this project already has a 30% after-tax rate of return. Wow. So 30% IRR. So the NPV of the project at $1,300 gold, $20 silver is over $330 million. And so, you know, this is a project that's because of the, the high grades and because it's close to surface within oxides, uh, cash costs here are all in sustaining 
um, on a silver equivalent basis are like 750 uh, an ounce silver. So very, very high margin. Um, and of course, we're expanding, we're proving that the, the resource um, is, is going to grow uh, mm. quite significantly, hopefully, um, and coming out with updated, um, you know, commodity price assumptions, etc. But even at $20 silver, even using the old or the, the existing resource, um, this project's already economic. And so that's why we're, we're fast tracking it as, as quickly as we can forward. Wow. This is one, one of the few projects where I think uh, you get those kind of economics at $20 silver. Understood. Um, next question we have from one of our Redditors is uh, Eric Sprott, who's very popular in our community. Uh, he's invested twice now on two rounds with you, once uh, in July of last year, and then again right away in August of last year. Uh, I think it was three million one time and then ten million another time, which is obviously a great endorsement that Eric Sprott believes in your company, and I assume he's done his due diligence and he thought, yeah, this is a viable mine. Um, but with Eric Sprott coming on as probably your largest investor, that brings a lot of attention uh, to you in the silver community, mm -hmm. and also a lot of pr pressure, obviously, to succeed. There's a lot of eyes on you right now. Um, how are you handling it? Do you, I mean, just, is this, let us know what you're thinking on that. Yeah, yeah, no, so of course, I mean, we're, we're very excited ourselves having Eric Sprott's uh, clearly a legendary mining investor. I mean, I couldn't think of a better shareholder. If I could pick anyone uh, to be our top shareholder, he'd certainly be around the top of the list there. Uh, so we're, we're delighted to have his support, his endorsement. Uh, as you mentioned, he came in this past summer, um, you know, uh, led our, our two previous financings. He now owns 16% of the company. Um, but I think we were also very fortunate alongside of Eric uh, to have uh, both Altius Minerals and SSR Mining as well as very supportive shareholders. So combined, the three of them uh, own close to 40% of the company. Wow. So we're, we're in very, very strong hands. Those shares, you know, <laughs> um, I'd like to say, you know, the, none of those parties have, have sold a single share. Um, and so, you know, the shareholder base is, uh, you know, very strong, very supportive. I'd say, you know, we're, we're continuing to, to deliver. I mean, time and time again here, we're coming out with, with draw results. So I think we're living up to our end of the expectation is this, this uh, project has significant potential to grow. And that's our focus is just proving uh, how big, how economic uh, this project can be. And so that, you know, uh, very, very clear focus for us and very much aligned uh, with, with our largest shareholders. Ivan, do you have another question? Yes, sir. So John, we have a question here from our community members. One of them is, tell us about mining in Argentina. In the media, we hear about the country being difficult to business in, capital controls of money, of getting money out, ETC. What is the risk level you are dealing with right now, John? Yeah. So no, I'm very, very happy to ask that question. <laughs> so with, without a doubt, uh, that's uh, certainly the, the biggest misconception, I think, that, that exists in our share price at, at the moment. And that's, you know, on the flip side, I mean, that's one of the biggest opportunities. Um, and so in Argentina, uh, I guess, first and foremost, it's important to understand the provinces own the mineral resources. Uh, each of the provinces are very highly autonomous. So each province has their own set of mining legislations, mining regulations. Uh, you deal with the, the provinces on, on permitting, et cetera. Um, and so there, there's a wide range uh, because of that. Um, so you have certain mining provinces where there's been large projects that have garnered a lot of headline noise. Uh, they've been unable to, to advance those projects. And, and those are in provinces um, you know, uh, on one end of, of the spectrum, on the complete other end of the spectrum, which doesn't really get reported, unfortunately, yeah. uh, you have a province like Salta. So in Salta, it's well known for, for lithium mining. Uh, we're surrounded by lithium mines, uh, but also for, for gold and, and copper as well as in, in silver, of course. And so you have uh, large companies. So you have Fortuna Silver has just completed construction, or not just, uh, within the last three to six months here, mm -hmm. completed construction of uh, the Lindero Gold Project, spent over $300 million on that. Uh, that's going very well for them. Uh, they received their permits there in relatively short order. Um, certainly no, no issues there. 
Uh, you have First Quantum, who's invested heavily uh, within Salta. So they acquired the Takataka Taka project, spent $500, $600 million just to acquire that. Uh, mm. To build that would be a multi-billion dollar project. Uh, you have Barrick, who's now in the Salta province as well. Um, and so, you know, you have corporates clearly understanding that this is, uh, Salta's open for, for business, for mining. And so, you know, uh, there's there's a big disconnect um, between what's actually going on in the ground. And of course, you have us and, and others uh, sort of exploring there. Um, so there's a very big disconnect between, you know, what's going on in the ground and uh, sort of the, the overall perception from, from North American investors. Mm -hmm. And I'd say even aside from, from the corporates uh, spending money in the ground and, you know, successfully buying and, and building projects, uh, the Fraser Institute, uh, well-known, obviously global um, studies that, that they come out with each year. So they rank mining jurisdictions globally. Um, and when they rank Latin America, Argentina is the only country within Latin America that they actually break down by province because oh. of the wide variance. And so this, they just came out with their latest report. So the 2020 study was just released like a few weeks ago. Salta was ranked number one. <laughs> oh, no way. In all, all of Latin America. So including Chile. I mean, Chile's always been at the forefront of, of the survey. You're just um, referring to what that one specific province uh, in within Argentina exactly. where you're operating is very favorable and goes against the grain for the typical expectation for Argentina. For sure. And there are certainly other very favorable provinces within Argentina as well. So San Juan is, is very well known being pro-mining. Uh, but yeah, no, it's, you know, we're, we're not trading as if we're in the best <laughs> uh, jurisdiction. I think that's uh, a misconception. People think of Argentina, like you said, they think of capital controls. Um, on that front, I mean, there's been companies operating there for well over a decade. I mean, Barrick, Newmont, Glencore, Yamana, uh, I've all been operating in Argentina for, you know, oh, then decades. It's fine. Uh, and, and have never had any issues with drawing cash. And so, you know, uh, I'd say people, <laughs> uh, yeah. it, it pays to kind of dig in a bit deeper than, than just the, the headlines. Yeah. Um, and it sold us without a doubt, uh, one of the premier jurisdictions, not only in Argentina, but in all of Latin America. Gotcha. Very good um, answer. Thank you. How much uh, cash, I, I heard in a recent interview you did back in December, you were at about 18 million cash on hand is... Um, which you know, it's understood. You're you're not a revenue producing company. You're an exploration, development type of company in the silver mining space. Uh, where are you at right now on cash, and what's your budget look like for the rest of the rest of the year? Yeah, no. So so we're still at similar cash levels, and so we have a, in addition to that eighteen million dollars. I mean, we have like forty million dollars of uh, warrants that are in the money. Nice. Uh, and certainly those are being exercised, um, you know, on, on a gradual basis as, as investors choose. Uh, so that continues to bring cash into the door uh, for us. So we're still sitting at 17, 18 million dollars today, uh, you know. Uh, so, so the cash balance is largely unchanged um, in terms of our exploration program. So we have, uh, we're finalizing this 13,000 meter program. This will be finalized within the next two, three weeks here. Um, once we get all those results, that's going to go into the updated resource that, that we mentioned and, and the updated study, yeah. uh, which will come out within the next six months. And then we'll announce sort of our next phase exploration program. I mean, there's clearly a ton of targets here. Uh, we'll continue to have two drill rigs going. Uh, but yeah, the 13,000 meter drill program costs $4 million. I mean, if you assume we have another similar stage uh, program, it's, it's going to be another $4 million. So the key is we're fully funded. Uh, to get this project all the way to a construction decision. So we're funded uh, for the next phase of exploration, for the PA study, for the ultimate feasibility study after that. Um, and we can get this project all the way permitted, um, ready to, to commence construction within two years. So you, so nothing's changed since December. You don't anticipate needing to raise cash again for 2021. Uh, that's... You're, you're, you're confident of that at this point, not 20, maybe 2022, if you make a decision to go further in the project, then that's where you are right now. Yeah. At, at the moment, we're fully funded for all of 21, all of 2022. Good. Now, oh, of course, all of 22. I mean, okay. Correct. Yeah. You know, we're fully funded all the way to, to a construction decision, which could be early 2023. And now, you know, a caveat is if we come across an extraordinary opportunity, an acquisition opportunity, 
something outside that there's currently no plans of that, but you, you never know. I mean, obviously if we come across something or, you know, we make a, a massive new discovery and have to get six rigs going on site <laughs> and we could need some, some extra capital, but for what we see for right now, for, for the next two years, we're, we're fully funded. How many rigs do you have on site right now? Two rigs. Two. Okay. That's good. Ivan, do you have another question? Yes, sir. We have a question for our editors for you, John, and they're saying, how much of Abra Silver do you personally own? How many stock options are out there? Our members want to know how much the top executives have riding on this, if you can answer that. Yeah, no, of course. Uh, so it's all public public information. Okay, good. Uh, so between myself and the board members, uh, so we own 3% of, of the company. So me personally, I would have about 3 million shares. Um, that's between, you know, a portion of those are, are restricted shares. Um, and, you know, probably two thirds are, are shares that I've purchased openly in, in the open market. And of course, I've participated in the financings myself. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, uh, it's a very lean management team, very yeah. on board. So, you know, if we had an extra 10, 15 employees, of course, that management insider uh, ownership would, would be significantly higher. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're, we're running this extremely lean um, but certainly, I mean, myself and, and a lot of our board members, I mean, this represents a, a huge portion of, of our net worth. So we have a, a lot of skin in the game. Yeah, I, I think at least investors like myself, I like to see that. Uh, but uh, you guys are invested yeah. and not just there for draining, you know, pulling cash out of the company. We want to see upside for the uh, senior management also. Um, so what you, I saw from a previous reports that Rio Tinto has a deal on one of, not on the Argentina project, but Rio Tinto has a deal on one of your other projects. Where are you? Where are you with that project? Is there any update going on? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Diablos, of course, is our flagship, but in addition to Diablos, we have three other earlier stage projects, uh, but all of those are, you know, potential to, to be quite significant. We, we feel for the company down the road. So in Chile, uh, we actually have one project in, in Chile, the rest are in Argentina. Uh, in Chile, we have a, a very large um, land package. So it's over 50,000 hectares of land in the premier copper belt uh, in, wow. in the world, in the Antofagasta region. So we own 100% of that project. Um, you know, there's several targets there. It's mostly copper gold, porphyry targets. And we brought in Rio Tinto as a partner to, to help us explore that. So Rio Tinto has the right to earn in up to 75% uh, by spending 25 million US on exploration. And mm -hmm. so we keep the, the remaining 25%, but we wouldn't have to spend anything uh, from, from our own treasury. Um, and so, yeah, Rio Tinto is expecting to commence there uh, shortly. I mean, that, it's certainly been delayed. It was supposed to be Q4 of, of last year, been delayed due to COVID. Uh, we're expecting within the next several weeks. I mean, uh, hopefully no later than, than a few months. Um, we should have an announcement there, but Rio Tinto is planning a, a 2,000 meter drill program there. Wow. Uh, we're, we're keenly waiting for, for them to, to commence drilling, of course. So by um, the end of, I, mo most of your active investors are, are looking for information out of Argentina because obviously that's the flagship, but uh, you know, I like to look at it more longer term myself. You, you might be announcing some drill results through your partner Rio Tinto by the end of the year, perhaps is that something or is that too soon to no, know no. about so, certainly no yeah no no without question unless there's of course uh, significant delays mm -hmm. um but yeah no certainly we, we, by the end of the year uh, for sure by, by okay. the end of uh, q2 potentially even yeah but i just like to I, I, I think a lot of investors just want to know what are the what are the catalysts out there for the next six to 12 months that we can maybe be expecting that's why i just okay. wanted to sort of define that time frame um ivan yes sir we have another question for you here, John, is what is the location like in Argentina? Are there any issues with road access, water supply, power supply? Will it be a difficult area to build a future mine due to remoteness? Yeah, so so we're high plains desert environment. So there's some, some pictures like landscape photos um, in our corporate presentation. So this is, it's essentially, it looks like you're in Nevada. So it's barren sort of land. There's no, you know, uh, fauna, there, there's no flora anywhere nearby, uh, but it's certainly much higher elevation. So you're up at 4,000 meters elevation. 
Um, but because there's multiple lithium, there's multiple borat mines uh, operating around us, mm -hmm. uh, the road access is, is very, very good. So we drive all the way up to site, all weather, roads. Nice. Uh, there's a natural gas pipeline that goes within 30 kilometers from our site. Um, there's actually discussions of the government building another natural gas pipeline that could potentially go even closer. Um, there's sufficient water. I mean, we're, we're doing some studies on, on the water uh, right now, but there's been uh, five wells that I believe have been drilled in the past, and we'll be doing some, some additional drilling uh, for subterranean water, uh, but that does not seem to be an issue. Um, there's no communities at all nearby, so this is quite remote. Um, so from that perspective, I mean, it, it really is the ideal place where you could put an, an open pit operation. So very, very, I'd say relatively, I mean, low permitting risk. Um, and so, you know, I think from, from a location, we, we can drill year round. Uh, so of course we drilled all throughout the, the winter season there, uh, this, this past winter. Uh, so there, there was certainly no issues. So it's, it's, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're very, very pleased. Uh, for sure, with uh, the the infrastructure that's in place, and this can easily be developed into a, a mining camp. Now, John, what was what got you started into all this? Like, what was your first job, if you don't mind me asking? Yeah, no, no problem. Um, so, yeah, no, I've I've been in the uh, the mining industry my my entire career. Nice. So about 16, 17 years now. Um, and so, yeah, no, I'd say I got involved in mining uh, pretty serendipitously. So really just mostly by chance uh, more than anything. So I, I graduated from the University of Toronto with a finance degree. Oh, no way. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, did you graduate from there? <laughs> no, I'm in Canada. That's why. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I thought you were a fellow alumni. But yeah, no, so, so graduating from, from U of T, finance, um, you know, coming out of school, I was really just focus on getting a job in investment banking. And so as I was applying, I came across a posting uh, for a corporate development position at Barrett Gold. No way. And uh, I honestly had no idea what corporate development was. <laughs> but thankfully, I, I looked into it, uh, realized it's essentially in-house investment banking. Um, and so anyways, I ended up getting that job. And that was really my, my first experience in mining. Uh, I really fell in love with the industry from there. Wow. Um, and so since then, of course, worked, uh, been very fortunate. I've worked with some, some great mining companies. Uh, so Barrick, Lundin Mining, Orico Metals, uh, which was a spinoff. And we ultimately sold that company uh, to Sintera for, for $310 million. Wow. Uh, so that, that was a great win. And now, of course, running Aber Silver. And, um, you know, I think uh, the, the focus throughout my career has just been helping companies grow and, and create shareholder value. And uh, without a doubt, that's what we're looking to do here. Gotcha. Sounds good. Um, so the strategy for your team is not really to build the mine. You guys are looking, or just correct me if I'm wrong, you guys are looking to develop the resource, define it better, get, get all the permitting in place, basically so you can hand it off and sell this project to a larger producer partner. Is that the plan? So, so yeah, so our focus is to, to de-risk this company, uh, to, to de-risk the project, advance it forward, mm -hmm. and that would certainly unlock value. And so certainly uh, larger mining companies are very oftentimes willing to pay a lot more for a project as it's you know closer uh, to construction and has permits in place, you've proven out the, the upside. And so, you know, our focus right now is we have sort of a, a 24 month clock here where we're looking to put out the, the new results, the PA study, go straight into a feasibility study, nice. start the environmental permitting process as well, um, and then deliver the feasibility study with permits in hand. And then uh, within less than two years, we think this is a project that'll be ready to be constructed. Um, currently, we don't have the team to construct it ourselves, uh, but certainly, I mean, with a project, high quality uh, project like this, you can, uh, you know, attract uh, the, the right team if needed. So once we have the project de risk, we've added significant value, we'll, we'll assess our options. I mean, if we need to add, uh, you know, transform the team, add, uh, you know, uh, a number of, of team members that could help construct this project. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll do that. Otherwise, yeah, one logical opportunity is to look to uh, create value by by selling the project or partnering with someone. I mean, there, there's a lot of different options that, that you can go down at, at the right time. Uh, yeah. we'll, we'll evaluate all of those. Well, um, so you have several, you know, besides the one in Chile and the one in Argentina, you have several other projects. Is there any activity on those or are you sort of just 
holding those in your back pocket for after Argent the Argentina project? So, uh, so we have, yeah, so um, Diablos, of course, and Salta is a flagship. Arcus, I mentioned, uh, Rio Tinto should commence drilling there um, quite imminently, like within the next few weeks or months. Uh, then we have two other projects uh, that we expect to either be drilling ourselves or bring in a partner by year end. Nice. So we have two okay. projects in, so in San Juan province in Argentina. Uh, again, a very mining friendly province. Uh, one of them is called La Coipita. It's very similar to, to Arcus, just given it's a large land package, 50,000 hectares, uh, was formerly owned by Tech. Uh, they dropped it. Um, and, you know, there's been a number of uh, very interesting historical drill results. So we picked up that project um, and we could be drilling there. Again, that's for a big copper gold porphyry. Nice. Um, and so, you know, uh, we either bring in a partner there, drill that ourselves, uh, see if we can make a, an initial discovery. And then those other projects, again, we could look to monetize those, spin those off into a, into a new company. I mean, there's, a, you know, we'll, we'll look to uh, generate as much value from these other projects as we can. But first, first step is, of course, we need to have drill programs on, on these other properties. And mm -hmm. so we'll, we'll be drilling, um, you know, not only Diablos, but potentially La Coipita and our, our other project, Santo Domingo. Uh, by the end of this year, so we, okay. we, we have we'll have four active projects uh, before year end, and that's all that's all covered in the budget with your 18 million cash and the warrants that are gradually bringing cash in the door. Correct, it's all in the plan. Gotcha. Correct. Yeah. Um, last question I have really. Uh, we've covered, you know, I think all the basics of what I think our redditors and I think investors are interested in. Mm -hmm. But uh, something I got to point out on on Twitter, lots of people cited your company. It's literally their favorite small minor exploration stock. Yep. Um, <laughs> it's true. Literally, I, I announced I was going to be interviewing you, and I had like some major sized Twitter accounts wow. actually get excited because they wanted yeah. an update. Um, so, why? What makes your company different? For you know, there's there's dozens of small sm uh, silver mining companies. Mm -hmm. What's going on with your company that? <laughs> is, is getting <laughs> you're probably in the i would say you're in the top five wow. uh, in terms of wow. small silver companies in terms of the crowd that i listen to on twitter so what what do you think's making people feel that way about you well no it's certainly amazing to hear i had no idea <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe i'm listening to the wrong focused. maybe i'm listening <laughs> to the wrong people but i'm talking about small silver exploration Good. companies excellent. literally they tell me you're one of their favorites yeah and excellent no we're very happy to hear that um, I do think, I mean, we're, we certainly stand out. Look, within the silver space, you look at, uh, you look around. I mean, certainly silver has very strong fundamentals. We all know that on the demand side, but on the supply side, I mean, where are all the new projects going to come from? I think that's mm -hmm. the key question here. There are very few uh, large scale silver projects near development right now. Um, certainly we're, we're one of the very few that stand out. So we could be producing upwards of 10 million ounces a year of silver, um, there's very high scarcity value and clearly with the, the drill results that, that we're coming out uh, with, I mean, that has potential to grow, of yeah. course, as, as we grow the project. So I think, um, you know, people see that this is uh, quite an asymmetric opportunity. So on the downside, because we already have a, a PA that shows we're profitable, it already has uh, an NPV, so a net present value of the project at $20 silver, $1,300 gold. And that present value is uh, 80 cents per share. We're trading at 40. So we're wow. trading at half of the value based on the old resource, based on outdated yeah. commodity prices. Uh, and meanwhile, we're just continually, you know, press release after press release coming out with uh, very significant, um, not only silver intercepts, gold intercepts, but also copper intercepts as well at this project. Mm -hmm. So there's significant upside potential that's not being priced in. Wow. I think that's why we're clearly working as fast as possible to deliver this updated resource, this updated PA study. Um, you know, once that's out, I think they'll be able to crystallize the value. Look, this is based on the latest, um, you know, figures here, the latest drill results using more realistic commodity price assumptions. Uh, what, what's the value of this project? And compare that to our current share price. And mm -hmm. You know, I think at that time, if this big disconnect still exists, I'm not sure what else I'll do. I'll be uh, banging on the table and walking around with a neon sign and saying, what? <laughs> but, you know, this is one of the very few projects, I think, that at, at this stage, already this large, already this economic, 
um, but trading at, at a significant discount. And going back to the comments on Argentina, I think that that for sure plays a large, um, you know, a, a large factor. Um, but I think over time, people will start realizing that this is a mining friendly jurisdiction. Uh, this is a highly scarce project. Uh, and we're advancing this and the, the share price ultimately has to catch up. Well, you know, what, what you said about scarcity, uh, uh, I, I, I follow the global silver mining types of numbers. Uh, a lot of people aren't aware that global mining production for silver peaked yeah. back in 2015, 2016 at about 900 million ounces. And ever since then, it's been in a decline to the point where last year it was just right around 800 million ounces, whereas demand is growing with uh, solar panels, uh, battery packs, electric cars, investment demand. I mean, some of the numbers we've seen for for bullion and coins and bars from the investment community have skyrocketed in 2020 yeah. in terms of people having concerns about inflation, uh, money printing. I mean, it sounds like you you know you're bringing to you're bringing to the market or potentially a big project you know big a yeah. decent sized project yeah. i won't say huge but we'll say decent sized level of resources um at a time when the supply is just going to be in decline in a couple of years and yeah. so your time your timing might be absolutely perfect i'm thinking that's why i mean just for full disclosure i am a personal i am an investor in your company to a small amount not right. um uh, so I was familiar with your projects before we brought you on, uh, but, uh, you know, what's your thought in terms of the timing and I'm sure you're, you're all the numbers I just threw out, I'm sure you're aware of already of for production. What's your thoughts in those areas in terms of timing? Yeah. 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 No. So the timing could, <laughs> all the stars could be aligning here for sure. I think <laughs> everyone just has to be patient. Of course, everyone wants silver to go to $80 by, by tomorrow. Uh, I, I do too, but yeah, I think more realistically, as you said, the fundamentals couldn't be better. I mean, <laughs> what more favorable market conditions could you possibly have, you know, imagined? Um, so like you say, I mean, on the industrial side, whether it's solar panels, electrification of vehicles, build out of the 5G network, I mean, silver is an essential component in, in all of that. So industrial side demand is, is clearly increasing. On the monetary side, I think, you know, unfortunately, we're, we're living in an episode of uh, governments gone wild. Here. Yeah. <laughs> so we got global bankers, you know, central banks just printing money, propping up the economy by, by printing trillions of dollars out of thin air. I mean, clearly, that's going to lead to increased inflation. That's going to lead to, you know, devaluation of, of fiat currencies. Um, that all seems quite inevitable. But, of course, we'll, we'll take time to, to play out. Um, and then, like you said, in terms of silver projects, there, there aren't many. I mean, I could count on, on a handful, uh, maybe two hands at the most yeah. in terms of how many, you know, good sized projects, um, especially primary silver projects, right? Yeah, There's exactly. Gold, precious metal focused, uh, silver gold projects are out there. It's, it's very, very few. So this is very high scarcity value here. Um, and timing could be perfect. I mean, as things we're, we're just in the early innings of this silver bull market. Yeah. You look mm -hmm. at previous cycles. I mean, silver, I think over the last three cycles has gone up over 600%. Uh, we might be up 60% uh, in, in the last 12, 18 months here wow. uh, since, since the current bull market started. So, you know, two, three years down the road, um, so the, le the leverage materially higher. Yeah. And the then, leverage you, your 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 project brings just yeah. an incredible amount of leverage if silver does start hitting those thirty forty dollars an ounce types oh. of uh, prices. Yeah. So for for every dollar the silver price rises, uh, our net present value of a project under the old resource or the current resource um, goes up by thirty million dollars. And, uh -huh. and same with with gold. So for every hundred dollars ounce in the gold price. Another thirty million dollars. So sixty million dollars. Your, your, your current market cap is in the is one hundred sixty. Oh yeah. So yeah, yeah. So it's, we're it's talking material <laughs> material like, percentage for a one dollar increase. Yeah, silver silver, silver getting solidly above thirty, and you're you know, I would ex I know you can't comment on it, but I would expect your stock to take off. You know, you know, just start start going vertical. Oh yeah. But um, what's uh, are you surprised? that silver and gold have not responded to fundamentally you hear the news out there about, and if, if this is something you don't want to talk about, I understand if you do feel sure. comfortable commenting, great. But um, 
it would seem with the money printing going on out there, mm-hmm. I would have expected gold and silver to respond far more strongly to just the, the daily news that we're seeing. Do you have any thoughts on maybe why silver and gold are not? You've been in the industry a long time. I'd like to get your sure. your opinion. Yeah, no, so having been in the industry quite a long time, I think I'm quite used to it. <laughs> yeah. To, to be honest, I mean, silver and gold prices historically have kind of taken the, the stairs up and then the, the elevator down. Um, and so it, it clearly takes a long time uh, sort of to, to build momentum until, you know, you have all the right conditions in place like we did this past summer. And then it's like flicking on a light switch. The bubble will it, pop. You know, silver and, and gold are, are off to the races. Um, so, so we're still waiting for that to develop. I think clearly holding gold down has been the, the rise in the 10-year treasuries. I mean, back in August, uh, those were, you know, 50 basis points. It's now, you know, 150 basis points. Yeah. Um, and so as, you know, gold, what drives a gold price uh, for sure is um, real interest rates. And so as real interest rates are declining, um, gold price tends to do very well. And so you have nominal interest rates at least rising. And so that's been, been a bit of a headwind. Uh, for gold and probably similarly for silver. I mean, silver is performed yeah. better than gold, uh, but for sure. I mean, th- those two are generally well correlated. So as gold's moving higher, you, you tend to get silver outperforming. Um, so yeah, no, I think it, it just requires patience to, to be honest. Yeah. I've experienced 10 years of a bear market <laughs> um, where it's a lot of patience are required. I, I don't think that much patience is needed at this stage, Yeah, but you know, silver is not a get rich quick scheme. I mean, if you're don't tell, that, don't, don't, don't tell that to our members. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to edit that out, John. We got to <laughs> we got to have people's expectations uh, in line, though. That's so right. I think the fundamentals are strong. It could take months, or you know, maybe even up to to a few years to really get uh, prices moving. But all all the right pieces are are in place here. So mm-hmm. for for me, it's it's a buying opportunity. I mean, if you see. Um, you know, current commodity prices, uh, you know, I, I, my outlook is significantly higher uh, yeah. than where we're at today in a few years. And so you get opportunities like, like an Abra Silver, um, where you can take advantage of it. And, you know, uh, well, thank you very much, John. We really yes. appreciate you thank making you. the time today yeah. to, to join us and give us an update on your drill results. And if you've got future drill results that you feel like sharing, we'd love to have you back at that time and yes, please. that's some more. Perfect. Well, thank you very much for, for having me. And really, uh, it's my pleasure. And we'll we'll be having lots of drill results. So yeah, let's uh, yeah let's let's make this a regular thing. I'd be happy to. Awesome. Right. Well, thank you Thanks. everyone from the Wall Street Silver community. Thank you, John. Thank you, Jim Lewis. And then hopefully we talk to you all soon. Take care, everyone. Bye bye.